Alleluia. Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Alleluia. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Glory to God in the highest and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, Almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High. Jesus Christ with the Holy Spirit. In the glory of God the Father. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O God, you have prepared for those who love you such good things as surpass our understanding. Pour into our hearts such love towards you, that we, loving you in all things and above all things, may obtain your promises, which exceed all that we can desire. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. A reading from the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 17. Paul stood in front of the Areopagus and said, Athenians, I see how extremely religious you are in every way. For as I went through the city and looked carefully at the objects of your worship, I found among them an altar with the inscription, To an Unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, he who is Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in shrines made by human hands, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mortals life and breath and all things. From one ancestor he made all nations to inhabit the whole earth, and he allotted the times of their existence and the boundaries of the places where they would live, so that they would search for God and perhaps grope for him and find him, though indeed he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your own poets have said, for we too are his offspring. Since we are God's offspring, we ought not to think that the deity is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of mortals. While God has overlooked the times of human ignorance, now he commands all people everywhere to repent, because he has fixed a day on which the, he will have the world judged in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our psalm this morning is 66 verses 7 through 18, we will read in unison. Bless our God, you peoples, make the voice of his praise to be heard, who holds our souls in life and will not allow our feet to slip. For you, O God, have proved us. You have tried us just as silver is tried. You brought us into the snares. You laid heavy burdens upon our backs. 
You let enemies ride over our heads. We went through fire and water, but you brought us out to a place of refreshment. I will enter your house with burnt offerings and will pay you my vows, which I promised with my lips and spoke with my mouth when I was in trouble. I will offer you sacrifices of fat beasts with the smoke of rams. I will give you oxen and goats. Come and listen, all you who fear God, and I will tell you what he has done for me. I called out to him with my mouth, and his praise was on my tongue. If I had found evil in my heart, the Lord would not have heard me. But in truth, God has heard me. He has attended to the voice of my prayer. Blessed be God, who has not rejected my prayer, nor withheld his love from me. Our New Testament reading is from the first letter of Peter, chapter 3. <clears throat> now, who will harm you if you are eager to do what is good? But even if you do suffer for doing what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear what they fear, and do not be intimidated, but in your hearts sanctify Christ as Lord. Always be ready to make your defense to anyone who demands from you an accounting for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and reverence. Keep your conscience clear, so that when you are maligned, those who abuse you for your good conduct in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if suffering should be God's will, than to suffer for doing evil. For Christ also suffered for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, in order to bring you to God. He was put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which also he went and made a proclamation to the spirits in prison, who in former times did not obey, when God waited patiently in the days of Noah during the building of the ark, in which a few, that is, eight persons, were saved through water. And baptism, which this prefigured, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers made subject to him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus said, If you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. This is the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, and because he abides with you, and he will be in you. I will not leave you orphaned. I am coming to you. In a little while the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. Because I live, you will also live. On that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. They who have my commandments and keep them are those who love me. And those who love me will be loved by my Father, and I will love them and reveal myself to them. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Great things thou hast done, O Lord my God. I would name them and proclaim them, but they are more than I can tell. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Uh, good morning. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, uh, I am the Reverend Matt Warren, and I serve our two churches here in Plumas County. I serve as the vicar of uh, Christ the King, which is where I'm preaching to you from this morning. Uh, but I also serve the parish of Holy Spirit Lake Almanor up at the kind of cent- northern central part of our county. Um, it's a wonderful gift to be with all of you uh, up and down the Sierra Deanery. Uh, and thank you ahead of time for what will be your patience with this sermon. Uh, Growing up, my favorite computer game was Where in the World is Carmen Sandiego? The premise of the game is that you were a detective on the trail of the elusive super sleuth Carmen Sandiego and her crew of vile villains. Each mystery took you to three or four or sometimes five different locales before you eventually chased down the suspect. And if you could follow the clues, gather and present all of the evidence against the correct criminal, you won the game. This morning, our first lectionary text finds Paul preaching on the meaning of those altars dedicated to an unknown God in the city of Athens. It seems straightforward. Paul is gifted at rhetoric, and here he is using this skill with philosophers in Athens. But there is a lot more to the story of these altars built to an unknown God than I think first meets the eye. Paul's teaching this morning is a story about finding the presence of God in the midst of a pandemic. It is a lesson on how to recognize where God is active in our lives. And on top of all that, Paul's preaching is a masterclass on how we are supposed to evangelize. And to really understand the good news of this story, I think we're going to need those same detective skills that helped me track down Carmen Sandiego all those years ago. It is a journey that will take us from Athens to Crete and from the Holy Land to our homes in Plumas and Nevada counties. But perhaps most importantly, our lesson from Acts will take us out of our comfort zone and out into the world as heralds of God's salvation. And so I hope you will join me in this journey. When Paul arrives in Athens, the book of Acts tells us that he was greatly distressed by the number of idols in the city. Greek culture, if you remember from your middle school history class, worshipped a pantheon of gods and goddesses. There were shrines and altars to a host of gods and goddesses throughout Athens. And in addition to the altars dedicated to Zeus, Ares, and Apollo, and among the shrines devoted to Hera, Artemis, and the namesake of Athens, Athena, were a number of altars dedicated to an unknown god. And Paul uses these altars as evidence that the Athenians have been worshiping the god of Israel without knowing it without recognizing who God is. But the question we first have to ask is, where did these altars come from? And for that, we need to travel back in time some 600 years before Paul would arrive in Athens. 
And at that time, Athens was being devastated by a deadly plague. Hundreds of people were dead or dying, and no one seemed to know how to treat it. Now, 2,600 years ago, you didn't turn to doctors, you turned to priests. And now, looking at our reliance on doctors, nurses, and scientists, we call that progress. But one of the problems of having a whole host of gods is that when a plague breaks out, you don't know exactly which god is upset with you. So the city leaders went to the oracle, and the oracle directed them to find a philosopher named Epimendes on the island of Crete. Now Epimendes instructed that the Athenians should take a herd of sheep and let them loose along the city streets of Athens. Whenever a sheep were to lie down, they would find the nearest altar or shrine and sacrifice the sheep to that deity. And so if a sheep lay down across from the temple dedicated to Zeus, they would sacrifice the animal to Zeus. If another sheep lay down next to a shrine to Dionysus, you sacrificed it to Dionysus. The goal here was to appease as many gods as were necessary. But occasionally, a sheep would lie down far away from any temple or shrine. The question then became, who then should the animal be sacrificed to? One of the nice things about polytheism is that once you simply accepted that there was another yet unknown deity that needed to be appeased. And so fittingly, when a sheep would lie down next to no altar or shrine, the people of Athens would construct an altar and dedicate it to this unknown God. Now, fast forward back 600 years to Paul's time. Before our lectionary text begins this morning, Paul is invited to speak by two groups of philosophers. They wanted to know more about this new foreign God Paul was preaching about when he spoke about Jesus of Nazareth. And so, Acts says, Paul stood in front of the Areopagus, excuse me, and said, Athenians, I see how extremely religious you are in every way. For as I went through the city and looked carefully at the objects of your worship, I found among them altars with the inscription to an unknown God. What therefore you worship is unknown, this I proclaim to you. What Paul is trying to tell the Athenians is that the God of Israel, the God and Father of Jesus, is in fact not new. As it turns out, God has been in the midst of the Athenian people for centuries. The Athenians just didn't recognize God as who God is. Instead, it was an unknown God of old. They didn't have the vocabulary to ascribe their experience of the divine to what we know as the God of Israel. Instead of calling him by the name Paul knew, the people of Athens simply knew God as an unknown God. Thus, when they prayed for health and for protection, they prayed to this unknown God. Paul was here to provide the formal introduction to this once unknown God. Paul's preaching is literally a revelation. He is showing the people of Athens the God who made the world and everything in it. He who is the Lord of heaven and earth does not live in shrines made by human hands, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything. But since he himself gives to all mortals life and breath and all things. And what I love about this exchange is that Paul shows us today how we can be effective evangelists for the gospel. When people come up to Paul asking him to explain the tenets of his faith, he does not recite an early statement of faith, nor does he promise the greatness of a forthcoming book of common prayer. When someone asks him to explain the nature of God, Paul doesn't actually ever answer the question at least not the question that was asked. 
Instead, Paul invites his audience to examine their own lives and to consider how God is already, already at work in their lives. Now, we may never be in, invited to speak at the top of the Areopagus, but how many times has a friend or an acquaintance asked us about the church we go to? Now, as parishioners of Christ the King or Holy Spirit, Holy Trinity or Emmanuel Church, you, of course, would always answer, I go to church because the preaching is so good. But what if, instead of pointing to all the things we like, about church, what if we instead followed Paul's example and invited a question about how God has been active in their lives, not our own? What if instead of assuming that it is our responsibility to share the entire history of the relationship between creator and creation as we know and God in Christ, what if we simply ask them, have you ever felt like you were in the presence of something bigger? What might that invitation bring about? The image of the altar to an unknown God reminds me of the story of Jacob's ladder. Jacob was running for his life. With the help of his mother, he had cheated his brother Esau out of his birthright. And so with only the clothes on his back, he walked into the wilderness as far as his body would take him. Exhausted, the Bible tells us, he came to a certain place and stayed there for the night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones of that place, he put it under his head and lay down in that place. And he dreamed that there was a ladder set up on earth, the top of it reaching to heaven. And the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And the Lord stood beside him and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. Know that I am with you, and I will keep you wherever you go. Then Jacob woke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. And so what does Jacob do? He sets the stone he had once used as a pillow and lays it upright, pointing up to heaven. He pours oil over it and names the place Bethel, the house of God. When Jacob encountered and felt the presence of something greater, when he felt the presence of God, he wanted to mark that space as somehow sacred. Jacob sets up a sort of altar to God in that space. And the Athenians had a similar experience of God's presence. They chose to celebrate the healing and the safety from the plague offered by this divine presence with an altar to an unknown God. It would be 600 years later before Paul would help them with the language that this presence was none other than the God who created the whole world. And what I would like to offer this morning is that the world is actually full of altars like these. Like Jacob, like the Athenians, we wander into these thin spaces all the time. We feel the presence of something deeper, something greater, something beyond our understanding. Those of us in the Christian tradition, like Paul, have the experience and the vocabulary to identify this divine presence as the God who made the world and everything in it, he who is the Lord of heaven and of earth. But for a lot of people, these altars remain dedicated to just an unknown God. Living in Plumas and Nevada County, we know that we live and play among countless altars to the God who created the world and everything in it. We can sunbathe along the banks of the Yuba River, listening to the water carve granite into some sinuous curves. We can, 
uh, amidst a grove of giant trees whose knowledge is ancient and draws us out of time and place. We can awe at the hues of orange, red, and purple reflected in the waters of Buck's Lake, and we can marvel at the moonlight as it dances upon the surface of Lake Almanor. And these are just a few of the altars at which we have had the opportunity to worship. But they are also altars where our friends and neighbors worship as well. The largest single religious group in Northern California is spiritual but not religious. For them, for many of them, the beauty of the nature which surrounds us are an altar to an unknown God. And the good news that Paul shares with us this morning is a way to help people recognize how God has already been active in their own lives. We are not called to be evangelists who have to start from scratch. Instead, we are called rather to be a guide in this journey of faith for others. The good news this morning is that we are called to do nothing more than to help people recognize that God is already a part of their story, already a part of their lives. And the same sense of something greater, which draws not just us into the cathedrals of the natural world, they can also draw us into the quaint chapels found in the Sierra Deanery. Absolutely, we can experience God in the altars of the world. And I cannot commend Barbara Brown Taylor's book, An Altar in the World, highly enough if you need help in how to discover where these altars might be found. But these are not altars to an unknown God. They are built to honor and to praise a God who not only created all things, but redeemed all things as well. We are invited to bring our friends and neighbors to worship at these altars with us. And when we bring people to worship, we are not introducing them to God for the first time, but rather we are recognizing that God has been with us always. And that is a thanksgiving we can offer at any altar. Amen. And now let us affirm our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified, he has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. In the parish cycle of prayer, we remember the McNett family. In the deanery cycle of prayer, we remember Emmanuel Church, Grass Valley. 
In the diocesan cycle of prayer, we remember Holy Trinity, Eukaya. And in the Anglican cycle of prayer, we remember the Anglican Church of Korea. In peace, we pray to you, Lord God. For all people in their daily life and work, for our families, friends, and neighbors, and for those who are alone. For this community, the nation, and the world. For all who work for justice, freedom, and peace. For the just and proper use of your creation. For the victims of hunger, fear, injustice, and oppression. For all who are in danger, sorrow, or any kind of trouble. For those who minister to the sick, the friendless, and the needy. For the peace and unity of the Church of God. For all who proclaim the gospel and all who seek the truth. For Michael, our presiding bishop, and Megan, our bishop, and for all bishops and other ministers. For all who serve God in this church. For the special needs and concerns of this congregation. Hear us, Lord, for your mercy is great. We thank you, Lord, for all the blessings of this life. For the FRC class of 2020 and for all graduates in the year 2020. And for seasonable rain. We will exalt you, O God, our King. And praise your name forever and ever. We pray for all who have died, that they may have a place in your eternal kingdom. For Leslie. Lord, let your loving kindness be upon them who put their trust in you. This is another day, O Lord. I do not know what it will bring forth, but make me ready, Lord, for whatever it may be. If I am to stand up, help me to stand bravely. If I am to sit still, help me to sit quietly. If I am to lie low, help me to do it patiently. And if I am to do nothing, let me do it gallantly. Make these words more than words, and give me the Spirit of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Here. Uh, thank you again for uh, joining us for our weekly digital worship. Uh, the service will continue afterwards with our digital coffee hour on Zoom, so there should be a link appearing right now in your chat box. Uh, so we hope you're able to join us for that uh, coffee hour Zoom. It's uh, wonderful to catch up with everybody uh, and to uh, just have a little bit of time together on the digital sphere. Um, also on Zoom this week, we've got a, a number of meetings, so our preteen Bible study continues. Uh, we're going to be studying uh, how Abraham argues with God uh, tomorrow, Monday night at 7 o'clock for our, our preteen Bible study. So if you know someone in 4th through 8th grade who'd like to join us, uh, drop us a line. We'll add you to the email list. Uh, on Tuesday, we're going to continue having our uh, committee to reopen the church uh, as we've moved into phase two. Uh, we now are starting to prepare for in-person religious services, which is part of phase three. So uh, my thanks to those of you who uh, attended last week and uh, will continue their good work. Uh, masks arrived uh, today. Uh, we've measured the church for capacity. So uh, we're starting to kind of work through that task list. Uh, and if you'd like to help us with that, uh, we'd be uh, very grateful for your service. Uh, lastly, on Wednesday, our, sir, our Zoom class on uh, learning more about the Episcopal Church, uh, your faith, our story, um, be, will continue at 8 o'clock on Zoom. Uh, we've been growing uh, week by week, so it's not too late to join if you'd like to join us. Uh, it, we'd love to have you. So uh, all the links for those Zooms are being uh, placed in the chat box. Uh, also, of course, sign up for our email list. 
Uh, that will get, keep you informed with all these activities going on in the church. Uh, my thanks to all of you who continue to support the church so faithfully, uh, reminding everybody that you can continue to drop a check off uh, here in the uh, church office. Uh, you can mail a check. Uh, you can sign up for bill pay. You can give online. Uh, there's a host of different ways to support the church, but uh, I really just want to, uh, as we are entering month three of this, thank all of you for your financial support of the church. Uh, it, it's a, a wonderful sign of your faithfulness in a time of anxiety and worry. So my thanks to all of you. Uh, with that, uh, let our light so shine before others that they may glorify our God in heaven. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. It is a right and a good and a joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. But chiefly are we bound to praise you for the glorious resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. For he is the true Paschal Lamb who was sacrificed for us and has taken away the sin of the world. By his death he has destroyed death, and by his rising to life again he has won for us everlasting life. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. In union, O Lord, with the faithful at every altar of thy church, where the Holy Eucharist is now being celebrated, we desire to offer thee praise and thanksgiving. We present to thee our souls and bodies with the earnest wish that we may always be united to thee. And since we cannot now receive thee sacramentally, we beseech thee to come spiritually into our hearts. We unite ourselves to thee and embrace thee with all the affections of our souls. Let nothing ever separate thee from us. May we live and die in thy love. Amen. And now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Sanctify, O Lord, those whom you have called to the study and practice of the arts of healing and to the prevention of disease and pain. Strengthen them by your life-giving spirit that by their ministries the health of the community may be promoted and your creation glorified through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. And the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be upon you now and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. And finally, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Ghost be with us always. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much and have a wonderful day. God bless.
Like the challenge of her mind, I knew.